from a tree in a place made of brick. There was a stage and a red velvet curtain. And you were there.
talk a little bit about the inception of the company 10 years ago at Berkeley College, what the company has done uh, in the intervening 10 years. Yeah. And also, as I was, I was listening and, and watching the incredible Reza Abdo documentary yesterday, and thinking about when he died, I don't know if you were fortunate enough to see it, but it was a, a brilliant documentary that was done before the plenary session. Um, when he died after 10 years of work with his company, the work stopped, that there was no continuation because of, um, I don't know, his company decided that without their leader, they couldn't continue. But it's really heartening to me, who've been at Columbia for 30 years, to see generations of my students kind of training the next generation. So I'm going to kind of hand it over to Tanika Teleroba, who's the artistic director of Silent Theater, and Isaiah Washington is the captain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isaiah, I'm sorry. Robinson. Robinson is the uh, is the the musical director of the company. And Laura, uh, Fisher. Laura Fisher and Curtis Jackson are ensemble members who have been with the company since the beginning. Hi, you guys. Thanks you. Thank you so much for coming out today. And thank you, Columbia students, for lending your talents. <laughs> in a crash course of uh, sound theater devising work. De devising work. Uh, we actually started at Columbia College. We were uh, all of so that you're that are sitting on this panel today are alumni and are. Well, my last collegiate experience here was um, the show called Lulu, the Black and White Silent Film, which you saw an excerpt of that the Columbia students performed for you guys today. And we started because Sheldon Sh Sh gave us this play that seemed um, nebulous to me when I was reading it. It was very German and stilted, and language was difficult to handle. And we thought, what if we just take this product and apply this? very specific aesthetic to it, eliminate all the language and just count on all the action and see what the play has to say now. And it, it has taken so many different transformations. Every single time there was a new cast member or, or a new addition, it would take shape because we were relying on this palette that the new performers would bring in to augment what we were already uh, have, have set base for. And ultimately the production um, got produced professionally here in Chicago and then we bought this big old school bus and we painted it and gutted it and left our jobs and our family and our friends and got on the bus and left for New York <laughs> without anything. There was no support, financial support. We just kind of did the show to uh, survive, to eat. Um, and we went to New York and then ended up in San Francisco. And we'll tell you more about these stories. Uh, ran out of money and we had to do the show to survive literally. So this is sort of a, this big adventure that started us off. Uh, it created a family. We had to live together. We had to do laundry together and, and eat, and, and um, it created this very much a family bond between us. Uh, these are my brothers and sisters. I'm an only child. I consider Silent Theater my family, and uh, I, I love these people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when Tanaka says we had the idea to do this thing with the Vatican play, what she means is she had this idea, and then she had to fight a lot of people to let them to let her do it with us here at Columbia, and, and we that's how we got started. I do have to say that Sheldon was a huge advocate for us. I think Sheldon always wanted to see uh, new things come through, um, and I know that there are certain institutional practices. I think back in my day, I graduated in 2002. You guys are a little bit, maybe a little bit older generation. Right? Yeah, we were we were freshmen that first year. <laughs> yeah, it was all new. new Wonderful. Um, that certain. This was back before the 24-hour play festival came along. There was there were certain rules that were put into place for um, for institutions to really teach their um, students to apply theatrical skills in the outside world. Where we were coming from was pioneering a completely new, different thing. And how do you take this and, and treat it as a, a as an ensemble-based performance and take it out to the real world as a new genre of performance, a physical theater genre of performance that wasn't necessarily playing to the orthodox style of how things go theatrically. You go out in the world, you audition for two bits in a fluorescent room, you're talking to thin air, and you're, you get cast and you don't know if that person is, has the right chemistry with other people. You really want to bring it into a more workshop process and see how the two parties gel. 
and you grew up on the farm. I would also say for those of you who are not familiar with our program that, and I've been here for a long time, that the inception of the program was a traditional Stanislavski-based Second City training program. And in the last 10 years, particularly with our new chair, John Green, who you all have met, the, um, the bringing into the curriculum, devising different physical theater pedagogies, I think has really broadened and widened what the student who's leaving with has in her skill set. So I'm really appreciative of, of that building on that John did. And these folks were really, as Tantika said, pioneers regarding taking a Vedic in play, taking a piece of uh, Pandora's box or Earth Spirit and creating it in this kind of way. And um, you, you have also incubated, as I said, new methodologies that are now ongoing, which is really wonderful. Yeah, I have to say that we stumbled around a lot trying to figure out how, how to figure out how to go about doing what we do. We actually, it's taken us a decade to really be able to explain how we approach our um, work and how we execute it, because I feel like a lot of it is very unorthodox. Um, we don't, we, see, we have this kind of rule now when people will say, well, how, what's the first thing that you need to remember? And it's not about jumping into this process with your, with your head or your heart. You're not feeling it, you're not really thinking about it. It's really about jumping in with your feet. Because if you don't know what you're doing, then you're thinking about what you're doing, and that's not really interesting to watch on stage. So once we, and even, I mean, I, I think you guys will attest to this, when uh, we started working with the Columbia folks a few weeks ago, it was more about, you need to get from point A to point B. We'll figure out how you get from point A to point B later, but you just know that you need to enter here and you have to execute this by the time that you're gone. Um, and that gave, and, and also of course, and I'm gonna let you speak a little bit about music because I, I have to say music is such an important factor. It's the backbone of what we do. Oftentimes in rehearsal before we can go back to figure out what we're doing with the band is we'll experiment with all these different types of music that will fuel the action and, and sometimes change the mood and sometimes change the plot of what's going on. Um, and then Isaiah and, and the band will come in and, and they'll create music around that and add those little accents as canes are coming up and slaps are coming down and so forth. We used to didn't do that way. It used to be around the rehearsals all the time and you'd be sitting there going like, oh my God, get on with it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was, well, you know, if I can yeah, please. take the baton, you know, it's, um, it's been a really, it's always an interesting process and it's never, there's never a waste of time to be there during the entire personal process. As Tanika said, each time we've done this show, there has been a new addition, a new cast member, you know, and the majority of the cast, you know, at any given, in any given incarnation of this show has been made up of a majority of people who have done it before, but perhaps in a different role. So, and well, what I do, in a nutshell, what I do musically is I try to, uh, with this show, I try to establish a musical theme for each character. Because there is no spoken dialogue, uh, you know, we have to know that that's the father who's in, that's the drunken father who's entering because, oh, well, that's his music, you know, and, and, and he's coming in in his character and every, you know, and so on and so forth. So each prominent character uh, has, you know, has their own theme or each prominent happening has its, you know, these are musical cues, like a knock at the door, you know, which is something that I'm completely in control of. And, and you know, if I forget that there's a knock at the door, then someone's waiting off stage to enter, you know, and that's on me. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but, let me backtrack. In terms of being there throughout the entire rehearsal process, because each actor brings a different physicality to any character. So, uh, like, uh, how Why don't you show us? Like, show us like what an old man sounds like versus like the ingenue. Why don't you just who was the ingenue? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I was just <laughs> versus Rodrigo. Yeah. <laughs> versus. Uh, I mean, and I haven't, I wrote a lot of these things like, you know, 10 years ago, and I haven't really played a lot of them in a long time. Yeah, so uh, 
versus okay, so like for instance, uh, there's um there's a the maid and the butler. Perfect example, okay? There's a maid and there's a butler, okay? And every time we open a scene and the maid is there and she's cleaning and person but you know that was Marvin's butler you know uh, that was Jillian's maid theme you know mm -hmm. I've, I've, I had a different maid theme for when Robin played the maid and Dr. Shun has his own theme but there have been like four different actors I've had to come up with a theme for for Dr. Shun and it's always been different even today just today and this is the beautiful thing about it because you know each actor brings a different uh, aura to it, so it's so so it's all slightly different every time. And even though I have established themes, you know, in the head, they don't always come across, you know, the same way every time. And that is, I think, what makes this particular process unique. These actors can attest. Just today, we ran it together what three times, right? And every single t like, even when we did it now, it wasn't. Every single time that we've done it today, it's been a completely different organism because, because it just lives that way. And I think it's that way for the action on the stage, too. I mean, Absolutely. some of us have done Lulu like almost 200 times total over like the span of a lot of years. But we, to be able to maintain sanity, very, very quiet, controlled sanity, you have to play, and the play continues while you're doing the same play every night. Absolutely. So, you know, there's none of the must be here, unless it's something that's being accented. So, like a doorknob, or, you know, some, some of those things are kind of set. The, the major events of the show. But then we get to color in the lines a different color every time. Well, if nothing white. His eyes is black. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what, uh, actually, coming back to that, part of what sells, well, Lulu mostly, but I feel like a lot of our work is the fact that since you have no text, there's no subtext, you can't really deal with exposition or what's the flashback to the future because you're like, wait a minute, what, what's, what's going on? Nobody explain to me that we're now fast forward in time or we're going back. I mean, we, we use certain, we have to really pepper it. We can't really use those unless it's a big deal. So because the play is always present, there is a, um, uh, um, a self-awareness so uh, the audience and the actors and the music allow themselves to breathe together and always respond to what's going on on stage so if anything goes not per plan which always does every show there's nothing ever per plan then it's just going with it you automatically accept it and you go with it there is no question oh we should have done this I mean today I, I saw you guys just your know, wig fell off it's like things are falling apart it's like well, you go with it what are you going to do well, I think one of my favorite examples is one night, I think we were in San Francisco, and there's a scene, spoiler alert, there's a scene <laughs> where the Countess gets murdered by, uh, by Jack the Ripper. And one night, Laura just decided without, and a lot of these things would happen without a try notification to one another. We would like to surprise one another on stage. Lauren decided that she was not going to let Jack the Ripper kill her. She was going to take out a gun and shoot herself in the mouth. And, and that happened. And Jack that, the Ripper was really surprised. Yes, we <laughs> all were. <laughs> so was I. I mean, and just like... I didn't tell you. No. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I, in retrospect, I find out that there are a lot of things that went on backstage that I didn't know about because I'm on stage the entire time. They were having a ball back there. Uh, 
but yet, yeah, little things like that, and the fact that uh, the actor, Jeremy Byler, I think, was playing Jack the Ripper at that time, you know, he just, the look of, just the stunned look on his face was priceless. And then, but, okay. happens, but honest, and then just, okay, well, moving on to whatever happened next, and, you know, I, you know, and having to catch that, you know, having to catch that moment in the music, and me being totally surprised, and, and the Antonica being <laughs> totally surprised. I, I knew about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were working on that. We were <laughs> Whatever, but I mean, you get what I'm saying. Little things like that happened in every performance, you know. For Marvin and Jillian, would have a different bit every time uh, for the maid and the butler, you know. Every time they would do something different, and I would just have to be ready to play on whatever they decided to do. And uh, we would play, we would play tricks on. I mean, one of my, my favorite ones. You guys see, it's black and white, monochromatic, right? So. You know, everything is covered, our hair is dyed, our clothes are the way they are, our nails are black. And one night, Maddie, who plays like the young, kind of fresh puppy dog in love boy who's, who's following around Lulu, like, like in love with her, at one point in the middle of the scene, he hands her a handful of flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was terrible. It was, yeah. Yeah, well, we didn't necessarily like when we did stuff. You know, but we, you know, we were, so we went on this tour, right? This was 2006. And our tour was around, we, were, we had gotten into the New York Fringe Festival. And it was a really exciting time. It's summer in New York. A lot of us had never been there. It was a lot of our like first year out of school. Um, we took this school bus, and what we did to get people to show up was just walk around like these guys are walking around. And sometimes we'd park the bus and have an impromptu dance party on top of the bus. And I tell you what, there's no better marketing tool than having a bunch of freaks walking around with Lulu on the side of their bus. And people and then we sold out that, you know, Fringe Festival run and got an award. And Although, I gotta say, it really does depend on where you are. Cause, but that's true. Cause it doesn't always work some out. Some spots in New York, people were like, oh, uh, okay. I've seen it before. <laughs> oh, <laughs> look, a bus. Look, some freaks, honey. Yeah. You know, going back to Columbia, though, when we came out of Columbia and we decided to do this professionally, and, and this is part of the the ensemble power, I feel like, because we didn't, we opened up a theater company to do a show, and we were planning to close it right after. Who knew that 10 years later, we were like, oh, silent theater, we're stuck with the name silent theater, y'all, we're only gonna do silent shows. But two, two, two things happened out of that. One, since we didn't have a base, we had no idea how to go about producing shows, we had nothing to lose, really. So we, we would dress up, and we walked right into the Sun-Times and the Tribune, like silent telegrams invited uh, reviewers to come and see our productions because we had no other way. Nobody would, you know, pay attention to, to the show that was playing late night at City Lit. Nobody cared. But then the Tribune came and gave, gave us a great review, and then another paper, and then it was a just a, an avalanche. By the time we got into New York, we had such good press that we were able to be like, hey, we're the Chicago, we just played into it. We're the Chicago trip that got all these great accolades in Chicago and come and see us here. And we just played off of that card. We faked it till we made it, basically. The other thing that we discovered is that as we were going through our process, and Lulu was just scratching the surface, a lot of all these epiphanies came throughout the past 10 years. But sometimes if you, not sometimes, all the time, if you take language away, people seem to pay more attention. And our body language has to be more specific, more direct. It has to be, uh, we have to cut away all the fat so people can understand what we're saying. And in essence, when we're doing that, uh, we, were, we were able to connect with people on a different level. One that wasn't uh, taking a label or a word and taking this conception that people had of it and then um, and, and trying to fit into it. And we, were, we were really kind of saying more without speaking. That, that makes sense. And opening it up for greater accessibility, you know, um, so someone who doesn't have English as their first language can come and see one of silent theater's plays. Um, individuals who are hard of hearing or deaf can come and enjoy 
um, and understand and participate in the work. So As a matter of fact, our, in the past couple of years, we've developed more of a collaboration with the deaf community because there's actually ASL is a great bridge. Um, I think that there should be some kind of a universal language. I came from Bulgaria, so when I first came to the States, I actually had a very hard time. Not only were I didn't speak the language and I was trying to adapt to new culture and I was coming of age and all that insecurities, but you, um, people have preconceived notions when you don't speak a language, so it's hard to have a shared human experience. Even as I was experiencing Americana things like baseball games and so forth, I really felt out of place. And, I, and silent theater, in a way, has a much broader universal appeal. We always say we're, we're creating a universal language one gesture at a time. So we take what ASL has to offer, we take what the old silent film, Chaplin films have to offer, and are creating this sh human experience where we know a smile is a smile in any language, we know a broken heart translates in, in any culture. Um, and, and we're pushing the importance of that. Do we want to talk about? So, no, I was just I was just going to ask if there were if there are questions from the audience to engage in a dialogue. Uh, but before that, I just want to say as as the aesthetic, of course, the aesthetic is from D. W. Griffith and Lillian Gish and all of this, the silent images that we know from a hundred years ago. But I think it's also we heard some talk about sustainability of theater companies and the silent theater company is their 10, 10 year anniversary and kind of we know from great American institutions that have kind of stopped producing after 10 years. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little, this was a company that has not had a board until this year, has kind of created through moxie and sweat equity the ability to, to, to create their stuff. So any, anything about that that might be of interest just a little bit? Um, yeah, we had a phantom board. I think a lot of small theater companies start because they're just actors and they want to do work, which I actually very much commend. I think it's important for performers and young directors to go out and do what they love to do, do it the best they can in apartments if they have to, just so they can, they can A, practice public presentations, and also practice in the art of making art because it's there, it's two it's two pronged thing. There's the art side of it and there's the business side of it. And a lot of theater companies start because they're excited and they're talented. But what happens is they don't think about the bigger picture. And this happened to us. That's why I'm, I'm speaking of experience. They don't think of the bigger picture of like, well, what happens when you actually need to run a theater company? It is a lot of hard work and a lot of it is administrative and it and tends to kill your creativity. You get to a point where you're like, oh god, I'm just going through the general operations motions, but my art is suffering. And so how to balance that is a very difficult thing. This year, luckily, our board has expanded and has taken a huge chunk of that responsibility from the artistic ensemble. So the artistic ensemble can actually concentrate on the art and less on the industry. And also in terms of longevity, I mean, it's what you saw today. You know, we're, we want to bring younger, fresher, um, hard-working, excited, eager, hungry performers and start devising with them, create create pieces with them and give it new life because, you know, Curtis and Isaiah and I have <laughs> been doing it for a really long time and we still love performing and doing this together, but, you know, as you get older, you have families, you have children, you can't pick up your life and go on a bus and leave without anything. Mm -hmm. But that is, like, that thing that happened is why we're still here today, too, because you have to be fearless and um, believe that you, you're gonna just be able to exist and create and interest people or else we wouldn't have made it five years, let alone 10 years, if we hadn't just thought, well, what else are we gonna do? We might as well go take the show on the road. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have stayed, I don't think, performing if it hadn't been for that fearlessness. And I don't think we'll stay another 10 years unless we have, you know, new energy and new people to create with, um, a new life in, in the company and in the work. We also uh, feel like part of our genre, because it's this physical theater, and it, uh, you know, um, 
we deal with human issues, but it, it, it allows, because of our aesthetic, it allows for our ensemble to be quite diverse. We don't uh, want, the, we have performers play male or female roles. It doesn't have to be gender specific or race specific. It, it allows it to be pretty free because everybody in the ensemble is, is a human performer as opposed to they're cast because they're women or they're cast because they're black or they're cast because they can speak sign. Uh, it, it's all very um, malleable. People can come in and out of roles. And you know, we don't have like a traditional, you know, audition kind of thing. I mean, when we're looking for people to perform with, the way that we do that is by bring, inviting them to play with us and you know, put on some music and devise a scene and say like, okay, let's let's take three minutes and we need this thing, this thing, and this thing to happen. Go play silently and come back and we'll show each other. So. You know, it's not so much as, oh, they can really move, and oh, they're really great at making faces. It's, it's like, how do you do it together, and how can you respond to new things coming in? Because as we've said, you know, we're not like, we do this, and then we do this, and we do this. It has to be very interactive with one another. So, you know, we've started this devising process. And we invite people in, and that's what um, these guys have been a part of as well. As we're looking to remount this show, Lulu, after a million years again, you know, some some performers may have been in it before, but a lot of them will be new, fresh, and we, we learn who the right people are by playing together and you know generating many many works that might play into the the fi final project. I mean. I think we've seen, we've done what, five, six workshops where we've invited people in over the last few months, yeah, yeah. including like musician workshops and things like that. And, you know, there's little nuggets that get created that I know when we get into the rehearsal room, we'll be like, oh, remember when Leslie did that thing in that part? That was great. You know what? We should, we should try to do something with that or... You know, and that's, it's just like little nuggets feed into the whole thing. And then it, eventually it has to open, so you have to stop the work at some point. But you don't really, because you keep working on it, so. You know, just like the music punct punctuates when we're in a theater, it's also the lights that punctuate things. Um, we've developed a way of almost tricking people's eyes into understanding where the close-up would be if it's a film, you know? So with light, or with a gesture, or with complete stillness, you know, we're tricking the audience where to put their focus. Yeah, a lot of cinema techniques, I guess, we apply in the theatrical world. We treat it as, what if this is a camera, and how do we focus, you know, film is such a manipulative art form. With theater, it's a little bit different because you can see the lights and the sweat and all that. But I feel like there's also power in the fact that if we just go along with it, we're not relying to the audience that we're not putting on a show. Or as a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. We keep reminding them this is a show. And once you figure that out, get lost yourself in it, we'll come and remind you, like, I gotcha, and, and try to uh, bring it back around. I actually want to throw it back to you, Curtis, a little bit because I feel like, actually, Laura, you too, um, it's very important. For a long time, we just worked with each other. It was a nucleus of people, and we didn't really put it out to, to other people to join us. It was, we were dumb and young and exclusive. Uh, but then, uh, as people broke off, we realized that not only were, when you guys go out and do other things, I know you've done some film stuff and, and so forth, but when you return, you come back with all that, all that experience and, and new energy, uh, and also a light bringing new people where it, where they also bring out a, a tool, set of tools that we can play with. And being able to mix that all in the bag, reshuffling it, and reimagining it all is such an exciting process. But maybe you guys can speak a little bit more about going out of this process and then coming back into it. Yeah, yeah, I think part of the reason why the company has lasted for, for 10 years now uh, does have to do a lot with the new people that we love to work with, but also has to do with the fact that we're able to leave. We're able to like go off to Paris and study mime or something. We were able to go to grad school, which is what I did, uh, and go to New York and, and, and get a master's degree and, and, and learn more, more technique and more 
things that I personally am interested in so that I, when I come back to sign the theater company, say, hey guys, we got to put some workshops together for X, Y, and Z because I want to see how, how it works with, with, with you all. I want to see how it works with other people who might not experience a clowning class or, uh, um, or a Camilla del Arte class or even uh, uh, getting into different kinds of theatrical theory um, which you get into in, in grad school that's very, very heady, very intellectual. Um, I get to play and, and experiment with, with my company, with, with these people. Uh, and they're somewhat always available, uh, <laughs> but they're always interested. Uh, and that is always, again, like what Lauren was saying, it becomes, we start to develop these little nuggets that might seem appropriate for whatever we want to do in the future, for things that we are currently working on, or things that we might want to bring back in the past. Well, it's no, like, not you know, to mention you guys are starting to wear different hats. I mean, you, you yeah. directing, and there, there's, we're, we're, you can't just stay in the role of one thing. Uh, if, if you're in silent theater, you're never just a director, mm -hmm. you're never just the performer, you're never just the musical director, you're just constantly switching hats and, and, and um, Experience putting out your techniques and skills for good use in some way. Yeah, it's been it's been quite quite lovely coming back and, and regrouping with with the with the company and them wanting to know what other things are we capable of doing. Yeah. Uh, together or with with people you know that we have met along the way. Um, I think that's kind of how that that's the longevity for for me. There's always room for us to like go away, come back, and, and teach, so to speak. Yeah. And Curtis went kind of more of the academic route. I went more of the, what we call, talky route. Oh. I know, I do plays with words. <laughs> but you know, like, just jumping into Chicago fringe storefront theater, too, has been, you know, also, if you can imagine, like a tight little nucleus of 12 people traveling together for four months, you know, we are siblings and we love each other. And like, that also got pretty intense sometimes. I mean, we were lovers and friends and creators. And it, I mean, it gets messy. So, so you know, to, so to, to experience all of that life together, and then go and do some things on our own, but then come back and know this is our theatrical home. These are our uh, creative family, and I mean, not just creative family. We're, you know, we're there when we get married, we're there when people die, we're there when babies are born, and you know, I think that that is what an ensemble is. And you know, the exciting thing is Building upon that, um, you know, Chicago has such an amazing history of, sh of ensemble theater. Um, and this is kind of a new way of being an ensemble, just stripping it down. Um, but it's the same thing. It's a bunch of scrappy young people or, you know, different types of people getting together and saying, well, we can do this just as you know, good as someone else can, and we've got ideas too, and just throwing them out there. Um, and, but it is true, every time we step away for a project, for a couple years, for whatever it is, and come back, we're stronger when we come back together. Because um, we've, we've got more tools in our bag, <laughs> a tool bag. Thoughts from you folks about training or work or the ongoing challenges and assets and liabilities of keeping a group, keeping a group of people together and reinventing their work? John, anything? I, yeah, I think this. I'd like, I'd like to talk more about the trade because you, you're talking about device. Obviously, you, you, as Jeff said, that there's that lovely uh, reference point of silent theater and German expressions. Of so, for example, what process did you take? How wonderful students are in, in but what's, the, what's the fundamental training process? Um, there's two different types, but the ones that some of the Columbia students have recently experienced is training and going towards this world of the black and white silent film aesthetic, uh, in which we would create different scenarios. So people would, would be, there would be a movement exercise that would um, get all of their instincts going the right way. Um, um, so once 
so they're given a, a task. So like, uh, here's a scene for you, and you have to, uh, you're in an artist studio, and he's painting you, and you wouldn't hold still and see where that goes. So once uh, we have gone through the uh, walkings and the character work, uh, uh, um, character development, uh, you can go away on your own and come back and develop by something and then you come back and you're giving a piece of music and so there's a different element added at every single step of the way so uh, our job I mean mine specifically is not so much telling people what to do this was a, this particular bit is a little bit of a different example because we had to do an, an excerpt but uh, it's more about guiding people or offering a, a different set of hands that they can play throughout that experience. Um, I'm trying to think of like a specific example because we've gone through so many workshops. There was a good one um, that I think is pretty specific where our task was it's three people in a scene. So we got put together with three people and you saw today the, the, the split scene which is the tango and the vaudevillian comedic moment. Um, and those are um, switched back and forth with a freeze, like a tableau, and then the movement goes to the other person. So there was one actor who played both scenes, and you had to put in, I think it was five tableaus. So it would switch from one to the other. And we had like 10 minutes, three actors playing two, you know, one person is playing two different scenes, and then two other people are playing each one scene, and just going back and forth and playing with what, it, what it's like when you freeze, and then how, do you, how does energy get handed over to the other people? So also that idea of like training the eye, like here's where you're looking while this is frozen and now here's where you're looking. Um, so, so things like that, just giving them, um, you know. It's almost like physicalizing cinematic techniques. And actually I'm gonna, uh, for more of a general, so it's a more general broad uh, sense of it, uh, when we were doing the high school institute, uh, which is more of a general workshop that we do. So we would take, it, it mostly works with people who have never done this before. When you get people who are in really high training, they start to apply all that training to this, and a lot of it feels actually uh, instinctually wrong to sign with theater techniques. But in this general training, we would give everybody the same nursery run. So we Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch a, fetch a pail of water, I don't know what it is exactly. But you know, th that's familiar with everybody. The context is the same. And a lot of silent theater shows that have context that the audience shares, fairy tales, for example, everybody understands, they work better because we don't have to get anybody all that exposition. If you hear Romeo and Juliet, you know what that's about. So um, it helps to have action and to have, to have higher context already. So in the case of Jack and Jill, we'll break everybody up in, group, in groups of three. And they will be given Jack and Jill, same text, and then a, a, a genre, an explanation of that, what that genre is. So let's say it's Grand Guignol. They'll have like a little bit of explanation of what Grand Guignol was about. And they would have to take Jack and Joe and up the hill and perform it as a Grand Guignol piece. And then we'll come around and collaborate on what kind of music would make that more, uh, would work with their genre. Or it's the vaudeville genre, or it's German expressionism. So everybody would have a breakdown of what that's about, whether they use lights to make it happen, whether it's a specific type of gesticulation and body language that makes that genre specific. And then we would um, work through it, and everybody would get the chance to present it in front of the rest of the groups. And how much do you actually reference the work and look at? Them? I'm sorry? How much do you actually study a chapter? Or a Laurel and Hardy, or a Nosferatu, or even the silent blue. Well, so our some of our veterans have been doing this for so long. They've developed a physical language of their own, and they have honed their own skin, uh, sk skill. I wouldn't even necessarily say that they're emulating Charlie Chaplin. They uh, it's like a reference. It's like you know maybe you watch something together because there's a there's a um, Okay. an idea in it that's interesting that we might play with. Um, and in terms of emulating, you know, silent film, in, in a black and white silent play like Lulu, which isn't all of our work, we use the idea of, um, you know, in a silent film where there's the necessary dialogue comes on stage. So we do that as well. So when there's that moment where we need to know, like, oh, they're in London now. You know, there's a, 
just did a short time on the screen. With a, with a freeze and a blackout, you see, ah, oh, lunch in. Yeah. And then that person comes out of it, and it's as though um, they just got stuck in the middle of a gesture, and they're moving right on through it as soon as the lights come up. So that's you know another technique we use. Also, uh, something that's fun with people that are newer, and when you think about stripping away language, some people think you you can't move your mouth at all, you know, or some people are like talking the whole all the time. So learning, okay, when when is it natural to mouth words like he's a man or you know moments like that? And actually, we use a lot of the crutches to our help. So if you, if, let's say, um, talking through the entire thing, literally talking, verbalizing through rehearsal, saying, okay, now I'm going to come over here and now I'm going to take the this thing from you, talking through it and using that as a crutch is a great tool. We don't think it's like a bad thing. We encourage it because then it gets everybody on the same page. And then certain actors also bring a certain palette. We were saying, like Matt and Marvin are very good at mind people and Matt will stand there and us, well, I mean everybody, not just new people, but veterans too, and explain, okay, well it's about suspension. You, you're, you got a balloon and the balloon's going up and all of a sudden you're pulling it down and like what the tension is and all of a sudden you're flying around. So he understands Mining better than some people, and then he'll, he'll impart it to the newer crowd. And Curtis talks a lot. He's like, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to lift up this chair, and I'm going to say, hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it helps to, you know, get the expression. The, the expression is not of me, so to speak. <laughs> a lot of the things are more about drilling, uh, listening with your bodies to other people, who are also communicating with their bodies. So it's... Uh, uh, it's more of a presence than a, than a technique, and, and shaving away the, the, the things that distract you from that listening is more about kind of what silent theater is, rather than this is how you go about doing it, because everybody comes in from a completely different perspective or um, set of skills. They want to apply that, so it's more about the chemistry between people and what we're trying to communicate with as a, uh, as a team, as an ensemble. And that kind of goes along with the training process that we have for of anyone, you know, because this particular person right here is going to play a man in a dress completely differently than, than, than you know, Ian or, or Adam, I'm sorry, uh, which is going to be different from Jeff, you know, and, and so trying to find out all of your individual quirks and movements and how you would use that suspension on your own with the balloon uh, is part of the fun, and that's part of the process, that's part of the reason why we're able to, to gel together so well, because we're both trying to figure out how we do the same thing differently. I think a thing we always do in silent theater work, because we're really focusing in this conversation about this black and white silent thing that we do, but we, we also do other types mm -hmm. of work as well. But a thing that I think silent theater is known for in their shows is setting up the rules. Here, here are the rules of the game. For example, like we don't talk and we do no, I'm, I'm thinking of Madame Capri. You know, the, the rules are the ensemble does not speak. There is one person who is our na narrator who sings and speaks a little bit and interacts with the band. So we set these rules up and everybody kind of, once they figure out like, okay, here's the rules, here's how they do it, then we break the rule, you know, and, and keep everybody on their toes. All of a sudden, maybe it'll be, you know, a loud noise or something like that, but I think I think often, or it's, we've been playing together and like we're in this film and all of a sudden we're looking at you, you know? And so I think that's another thing that we try to do to, to keep it fun and keep it fresh and keep people not knowing what's going to happen next and, and excited about it. And also keeping the audience a part of it. The audience are just as much part of the story as the story and the performers. We always pay pretty close attention to you being on the journey with us. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Park. Uh, one, one of the conversations that comes up a lot in Ned and in, in our membership is about um, collaborative decision making, and you've referenced a lot of that as, as you've been talking. And I wondered if you might be able to just talk a little bit more specifically about uh, what does that look like for you both artistically and then conversely administratively. Is it uh, is there a hierarchy in terms of roles? Does that change project to project? Does it change rehearsal to rehearsal? Is it completely collaborative? And so I, I'd love for you to talk like administratively and then also artistically and, and, and 
curious to see what that looks like for you. I'll, to, uh, I'll talk to the, about the administrative side of it, because for a long time it was like a one-woman orchestra. I was trying to do it all. And I think it was out of fear that if, if I engaged artistic people into the administrative process, I wouldn't lose them artistically because I was overwhelming them with administrative tasks. Um, that is not the way to do things, obviously. I, I learned my lesson. And about four years ago, there was a team of four people that started doing a lot of these um, produ production tasks. And that alleviated a lot. I also have, you know, I, I, I have twins. And my, my kids are five years old. So after they were born, it became very difficult for me to, to run a theater company. But um, these four people came together and they started uh, producing a lot more of the administrative tasks. And I was able to concentrate more on the artistic stuff. Artistically, I always feel like it was a, div um, a, a collaborative process. Um, there is different directors that go into, a, you know, People have ideas and they want to conceive a show. Once they the, it's agreed that it's going to be produced by Silent Theater, then those people become the rain holders. They're the ones who are making decisions as far as this is what my marketing, I want my marketing to look this way. I want my uh, space to look this way because we try to tailor, tailor everything to the show. It's never the same from show to show. So the selection of that show, is it a consensus process? Does everyone have to agree or does the artistic yeah, ensemble, so yeah, the artistic ensemble folks it in. Yeah, it's not like one person making a decision. So it's a so a consensus structure for which project you select or. Correct. Yeah, and anybody's you know allowed to bring ideas to the table. You know, some of the work we've done, like Silent Christmas Carol. Uh, we've done a Charlie Chaplin play. Um, Nosferatu was like a you know kind of cool thing that was spearheaded by Brendan and was kind of completely separate from a lot of us from the artistic ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very very much it was a silent theater show. You know we just got some fresh young people in and some ideas. You know and then and then uh, we worked together too and bring in you know we're each other's outside eyes um, if we're not involved in the project. Jack is often our outside eyes as well, um, kind of helping us work out some kinks. And it's also, it's not like there are 12 people, 15 people, 20 people, however many are in the company at any given moment. They're not all banging down at the door saying, I want to do this play, I want to do this play, I want to do this play. There are some people who want to do a play and just have the, the thought of doing it and wanting Silent Theater Company to produce it. And we'll take the next three to five years just thinking about it. Mm -hmm just working it out on their own. We will talk about it. And I think everything that we've kind of done together has been talked about at bars, mentioned, uh, at parties, uh, at weddings, at, in the hospitals. I'm still waiting at, for the Silent Theater uh, Western <laughs> we're, we're, talking about this one. It's like if, if I have an idea to do something, we probably have talked about it for a few years before. And I actually try to get the vote, you know what I mean? And, it's, and when I try to get the vote, I'm like, hey, I think this is the year. Most likely everyone is like, oh, we already know. We're already, everyone's kind of working on it already. That's kind of how close the ensemble is. We kind of know each other's ideas for each other's projects and are working on them before we even pitch them. Yeah, I mean, I think that casual, especially if you want to work with specific people, you casually mention things throughout the year. But really, there is, in January, the artistic ensemble meets and we do pitches. Mm -hmm. So I'll get up and say, okay, I've started working on this play, and everybody's got their own technique too. Marvin comes in and he just reenacts the entire play by himself. And you've seen him do Do and Gentleman Chunk. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, he's yeah. incredibly yeah. animated. And he's not necessarily a good scribe, but he will <laughs> act the whole thing for you. <laughs> and um, in his pitch. And, and it's, um, his pitch. Or, or some people have visual presentations, they'll have a PowerPoint presentation. So. The more that you put energy towards your pitch, the more it likely it's going to get produced within that year. Otherwise, it might get shelved to be workshop that year, but not really produced until next year. So it's all, but there is a January month where we are like, okay, let's look at what new work is really brewing right now and it's pertinent to do. It's also not, even if we have a show that we've wanted to do for a while, if it's not the right time, we can't push it. We can't even announce our season and say, we're gonna do this, this, and this this year. We tried this last year and it killed us. Um, because it um, sometimes it's just not the right time. The, the times change politically. Things are different. Socially, things are different. So we're more about really feeling the when the vibe is right to produce something. 
And another way that we get to explore some of those things, we do a, a quarterly variety hour at our, um, at our space that we have. And so that's also a time that if there's like an idea of something that you want to play with with another ensemble member, you might be like, oh, let's do, let's, let's, let's work on that thing for the variety hour and do a 10 minute piece. And then, you know, see how people are responding to that and does that go into something bigger. Um, so there's always an opportunity to be playing together if, if the idea is strong, even if it's not something that we've decided like, yes, we're going to as a company do this thing, here's the next show. I mean, it just starts as fun little goofball moments. And, and when we were on tour too, you know, another thing that we were doing while we were doing Lulu over and over and over again, when we were off on Monday and Tuesday nights, our only nights off in San Francisco, we were doing a variety show, you know, and we're like bringing new material and, and some stuff that was like, some of it was so bad. And <laughs> some of it was really good. And like we resurrect the things from stuff that we made up in parking lots and Reno. Oh. Reno <laughs> songs. It's not always silent too. Sometimes we are being pretty loud. Sometimes administratively. Uh, it has to do with who we are and what resources we have, right? right? So, so I mean, in terms of like we're all Columbia uh, alumni, most of us are. So sometimes we have the resources here to uh, to use a rehearsal room or to uh, contact students who, who would like to be a part of you know devising something for for yes. for this what's happening today. Uh, so it's it's yeah administrative in terms of like who's executing what signature on um, this check or what have you. Uh, sometimes it also has to do with, well, who, who has better access to do that. Yeah, we, tr we try to go for the rule of the best man for the job is going to do that job. Because we've all been given the task before where we're like, I got sent to Kinko's one time to do a program, and I'm visually really bad with things and trying to figure out how to do it so you can fold it the right way. It was just a disaster, you know. But then again, it's like, well, I can throw a little event together, no problem. I can get a gazillion silent auction packages because that's what I, you know, my day job is in fundraising now too. So, but that's but that's because I had <laughs> I had to learn how to fundraise and throw events so we could stay afloat, like. 10 years ago, and then, you know, now I do that professionally, which is pretty weird. But when we were doing it, I didn't know what I was doing at all. <laughs> Just try to do, do the best you can. And you did so wonderful. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Any last thoughts? Youngins? What are you going to do? I think, um, like they talked about, one of the greatest thing that they offer half of the room is, uh, is that sense of play and, and the, the sense that even though you know they have been doing this for 10 years and we're just jumping in the fact that like we're as much there as they are and we're, we're treated as equals and it's, 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 it's great because we'll, we'll be working on that thing even like today like they talk about things living and breathing and changing and as we were rehearsing before this today you know like they, they would just critique or uh, fine tune like a little bit make make this gesture bigger as Curtis kept saying over and over and like yeah, and like <laughs> have not having as much like, experience as them it, it's great to like to to get um, to get taught on a moment to moment basis and to take that in and go okay I know I know to make it bigger so when I go to do the next thing I don't have to learn that over and on a technical level, um, due to the fact that this is a very specific aesthetic, you, you have to bring certain practices to it, which you wouldn't typically bring to like a piece of theater that is spoken. Um, one of the big things that they emphasized was in silent theater, there are frame skips. There are these moments where you can't exactly tell what's going on because that's just the way the camera used to work. Uh, and trying to work through that problem on stage is a really interesting challenge for any young performer to go with that. So, it's clear, Josh. It, and it also provides uh, an, an interesting, uh, an interesting way to think about uh, to, to think about just theater as, as a whole. Not even doesn't matter that it's silent. Doesn't matter if it said anything at all. But it it really helped us learn how to 
Um, like, um, like Isaiah uses the piano, we use our bodies. And as actors, that's really important to, to learn, and even this early, to learn um, that our, our bodies are our instruments. And <coughs> silent theater not only um, not only not only teaches teaches us that, but it, it, it encapsulates it. It's it's what it is, you know. Really just really just living uh, living in your body and just being able to um, to, to show the experiences that you're having without having to say. Yeah, and to kind of piggyback off of that, uh, I heard this crazy statistic a while back of like only like we get 75% of communication from other people from our body language, not necessarily the words. And I think there's a lot of acting, especially in other things when, when people are learning where they're saying these words, but they're not telling that story. They're not telling that story with their body. And so here it's an isolated chance where you have to tell the story with the body, your body and your whole being because that's the only route you have to tell it. Actually, that's a great. Uh, yeah, I think so. And that's a great point because I feel like with um, talking plays, um, you, there's that contradiction happening all the time. It really behooves, uh, even if we, we're doing something very, very verbose, even if you're doing Shakespeare, that you, it behooves you to do the entire thing silently, just so you can tell where your, what your, what your mind is thinking when your body is moving to try to co communicate. What, because it's so contradictory on stage sometimes. I feel like that it's in, in real life it's very hard to tell if somebody's lying because you take tell you, you, you can say that oh I, I take it for truth value. Whatever you say to me, I take why would I have why would I think that you're lying? But on stage it's different. In stage you have to convince us of your authenticity and it becomes very, very difficult if you are saying one thing but your body is doing something entirely different. So I, I feel like uh, with silent theater we try to make it a lot more authentic by simply having the body language communicate what's true. That, that, uh, going back to what I was saying at the very beginning, that sometimes you're saying a lot more when you're not speaking at all. And for those of us that have gone through like that training and do a lot of it, it really does impact our work when we when we open our mouths to speak on stage as well. I mean, it really, it really tones that muscle so that you can bring that to the stage when, when you're even doing one of these silly talking plays. I love playing plays with text. We do. <laughs> and we all we all actually do them. Yeah. 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 This game silent theater, it's not like it's like, oh well, let's just do a it's normal play. As a matter of fact, every show I've ever done with silent theater requires me to make some kind of noise. <laughs> <laughs> One show we did a production of the Wild Party where uh, where I actually I sang all the dialogue. Oh, yeah. And, uh, we did it from the original, I don't, I don't know who the uh, Monk Your March, Joseph Monk Your March. March. Yes, uh, we did a production where, uh, where all the action was silent, and uh, and I just kind of like wrote music to, did we, was the entire poem? It, it was the whole poem. It was the whole poem. Oh, oh, Jesus, it was really good. <laughs> yeah, it was well, really good. Yeah. It, it happened. You just have to go to the bathroom halfway through the show. Actually, it did happen one time. It did happen one time. One time during a wild party, I did have to go to the bathroom. Hey, so any other questions? <laughs> 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 you get to the bathroom? I, no, I wasn't telling that one. I was telling, oh, okay. I was telling the wild party bathroom story where I actually stopped playing and moved out and went to the bathroom during the show. Just test it. Yeah. We live in the moment very long. Ago. Yes, we do. Is there, do you guys have any shows coming up? Mm. We're gonna do Lulu. We we were reimagining the story though uh, in a kind of a big adventure way, a big experience way. So we, we did this product ten years ago, and it was um, a, a great experience for us. Obviously, it was a great adventure, uh, and the quality became good because these guys developed a physical language by themselves, and it, it just it was tight and sexy and visceral, and uh, you felt so alive sitting in the audience. Uh, we, we used to tell people who are going home and banging after this because it was just no no way that it was it was so emotionally. It, it, Alive. Also very sexy. Um, it was, but you know, we didn't want to come back to this ten years later. We're now in our thirties and we're fat <laughs> and uh, slower, and we got lot back problems. And, and it wasn't just a, why, why even re, why why even redo it? What's the point of just redoing a show we did ten years ago? And 
one of the elements that I kept bringing up is the fact that we told the story of Lulu and it was alive and visceral and raw and sexy and fun and energetic, but we didn't really get into the psychology, psych psychology of why the story exists. And every single time I've seen a, a reincarnation of Lulu, whether it's the operetta or the uh, Pandora's box, the film, or other different uh, Pandora box stories, they feel from a, this very male perspective that they were written as, as this female this male projection of this female and she's playing each role in. and that left Lulu really nowhere and really approaching it from that perspective why from this female and how she the spirited female and why is society telling her this is wrong and this is right and she's got to say this is who I am and I'm, I'm never going to lie to you I unapologetically am who I am and, and this patriarchal society coming back to I'll call, constantly call her you're the guilty you're the person that this is happening because of um, so that was one aspect, the artistic aspect. And the other thing is that the, the past 10 years, um, we've done productions, and we also run a space called HQ. We, we try to create these experiences that have an immersive component to them. So it wasn't just people watching a show and there's a fourth wall and none of that. Um, so we wanted to take this adventure and turn it into a three-aspect thing. So we have the live presentation. We also have a filmed production of the live presentation, but it's filmed as a movie, so there'll be a final product that's a film of the stage uh, version. And then when people come to see the live version, there'll be a live taping of the audience while they're watching the show. So when they go home, they can download the movie we've already recorded with now these inserts of them as part of it, which will encourage people to dress up, will encourage, there's a little interactive element that they can do before the show and during the show, and, and hopefully create a more of a, I'm a part of this experience. That's why we're, we're not even calling it Lulu Black and White Silent Play, we're calling it Lulu a Life Silver Screen Adventure, or it's Life Silver Screen Experience, excuse me. We did start hitting on this thing, I think especially when we were in San Francisco, because we were there for so long, the people started participating in the work with us kind of really organically. There was a photographer that just kind of kept hanging out on the bus and taking photos. Um, there was a painter that was really inspired by what we were doing and was painting us and um, we were making films and doing things and people wanted to participate so it, they wanted to dress up. They, want, they thought it was fun to like be in black and white gear too. So we're, we're kind of taking that idea and seeing how far we can take it. Like, and we've actually got this to be an event. on stage because this, they don't have to memorize lines. It's about <laughs> being present. And you just tell them the rules and, and, and put it in the aesthetic, and they can experience it <laughs> as nerve wracking as it may be as the time as it's happening. Did they come yeah, yeah, we did. On stage. You have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we should, we, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you.